Hello my friend, in this discussion I ask a skincare expert how to create the best anti-aging skincare routine from home. She demystifies the entire process and also shares the best procedures to get from a medical provider or a dermatologist when you go into their office. Stay tuned for an exciting episode and if you like this amazing information that we're sharing on this channel, please make sure to hit the subscribe button below so you can get notified of future episodes. With that said, let's dive right in. Hello, my friend. Welcome back to the Anti-Aging Hacks podcast. Today, I have a very special guest. My friend Rachel Varga is here to talk about everything skin from the outside in. And if you can't tell, I'm super excited about this, by the way. So in terms of an introduction, Rachel Varga is a board-certified aesthetic nurse specialist since 2011 with over 20,000 procedures performed. She's an international clinical trainer, celebrity skin expert featured on Bulletproof Radio, Ask the Health Expert podcast with JJ Virgin, and more. She's also a speaker and academically published award-winning author in the field of plastic and aesthetic nursing, as well as an executive board member and peer reviewer for the Plastic Surgery nursing journal. Sounds pretty legit to me, whatever that is. Uh, through education on skincare, skin and laser rejuvenation, non-surgical solutions and healing lifestyle practices, Rachel helps inspire others with her unique toolkit to navigate and strategize aging impossibly well using the holistic science of beauty at rachelvarga.ca and CA stands for Canada. Rachel, welcome to the Anti-Aging Hacks podcast. It's so great to be here for us. We always have such wonderful conversations and I just had the pleasure of interviewing you on my podcast, the Rachel Varga podcast as well. And we shared all sorts of really cool things. So I'm excited for another, I'm excited for another conversation. Yeah, absolutely. So I love, by the way, I love having you on because I'm focused more on biohacking and internal anti-aging. How do we slow that down from a molecular level? And uh, here you are, the perfect compliment where you talk about skin outside in. And so I'm obviously vain, if people can't tell, but I've recently become vain. I was never vain uh, earlier. I didn't care what, I, what my skin looked like. I didn't, you know, barely put uh, any moisturizer on my skin at night or even wash my face until I was 35, I don't think. I washed it a couple of days and it was good to go. Uh, I would wash in the morning, but maybe not at night. So the, my point is, you are a perfect... Uh, person to bring on because you can talk about skin. You just told me recently on our, on our previous recording that we had that you were more of a tomboy growing up and I would have pegged you as a beauty queen, like, you know, like the homecoming queen where she's perfect doll. Uh, cause you look like you're very well put together. So in terms of that, let me ask you the question, tell us about your bio. How did you get into the field of beauty and what has been your experience since? Yeah. I mean, it's pretty simple. In my mid twenties, I thought, Hey, I want to start doing a couple of things for myself, improve some of my forehead lines and uh, things like that. And so I had my first treatment and I actually felt like the whole process should have been a little bit better. And the after information I got, the education on the treatment itself, uh, extra information, I didn't really have like a very long consultation. Unfortunately, what the norm is, is about a 15 to 30 minute consultation with a consultant in a med spa. And that didn't really feel good to me. I didn't feel like that was enough information because after I had a treatment, I went on YouTube and I went on Google and, you know, there's a whole ton of misinformation out there, you know, word to the wise. So I was also at that point applying to medical school, doing my med school prerequisites. So on top of my bachelor's of science in nursing, I have a year in gen chem, organic chem and biochem. So I thought that that was going to be my path, getting into medicine and becoming a medical doctor myself. So I linked up with a surgeon to basically see the runnings of a clinic. I promised him a year I'd be doing the rejuvenation stuff, skincare, lasers, injectables, body contouring, assisting with some minor surgeries. Promised him a year and then I'd be off to med school. It's been 10. So clearly I found my passion with just really helping people optimize what they're doing on their skin, what that looks like at home with their skincare, dermal rolling, what that looks like in the clinic with say laser technologies, injectables, body contouring, sometimes some surgeries as well. And that's my passion is just helping people have a plan no matter where they are in the world. Because again, the norm is like a free 15, 30 minute consult. And I give people like the whole meal deal plan, combining the best of both worlds, skincare at home, all that, all that really important at home stuff, which is actually mm -hmm. more important than in clinic stuff, but also then how to weave in modern technologies, 
biohacking from the inside out, because what you do internally is really going to set the stage for what's going on on the outside. The, the, for example, the energy output of our biofield and what is our radiance and what does that look like and what technologies can we actually use to measure it? As I'm looking on my computer screen to my full field, uh, my full biofield scan that I did this morning. Fantastic. Which was at 97%, just so. Oh, well done. Well done. So you're pretty optimized, pretty yeah. radiant, if I may. Uh, so let me ask you this. You said you, and this is a side question for you, you said you started going to a specialist when you were in your mid 20s. So I assume, let's just say 25. And I live in Los Angeles and I see this all the time. Women complain about being old at age 26. And I go, what is wrong with you? You are young. You're a spring chicken. But they're like, no, I'm old. Uh, so, and then men don't worry about it at all until they're probably closer to 40. They're like, oh, I'm invincible. I can do anything. I can, you know, conquer the world. And then at 40, they're like, oh, maybe I'm mortal after all. So why is this because society tells us that women have to look perfect and they have to look beautiful, or is it that skin changes start to happen at a no noticeable level uh, in women differently than men? What's, what's been your experience? Absolutely. So women start to show some of the initial signs of collagen loss, hyperpigmentation, age spots, fine lines, usually at that late 20s, early 30s. And then what starts to happen is the whole concept of menopause. So the clinical data shows this and I actually have on my social media at Rachel Varga Official, actually a screenshot from a study that looked at men and women and their facial shape changes between the ages of 50 to 60. So what's going on for women is menopause. There's a sharp decline, about 30% collagen loss happens at menopause. So women's faces change shape, get this, three times faster than men's between the ages of 50 to 60. So generally men don't have to do as much as women. We have different aging processes, which is really, really interesting. And I find that, um, you know, we tend to have different complaints at different decades in our lives. And that does vary across, um, you know, background, ethnicities, genders, things like that. Okay, fantastic. Which is what I was going to ask you is next is what are the different problem areas? And I can talk about mine in a second. But when you work with people, men or women, uh, let's just say premenopausal, right? Let's say 30s, 40s, the, the beginning signs of aging. What starts to go first on the face? Is it the uh, area under the eyes? Is it the jowls? What do you see most common? It's the hypermobile areas of the face. So I've written two papers. First paper is on the eyes. So you can actually just look up my name, Rachel Varga on PubMed. You'll find uh, my papers there. So around the eyes, we have a muscle that wraps around our eyeball called the ubiculus oculi. It's moving all the time to open our eyes. It allows us to blink and express and things like that. So firstly, we see signs of low brow, hooded eyelids, crow's feet, puffy lower eye bags. It's usually kind of number one. And then the second hypermobile area of the face to show signs of aging is around the mouth. Again, sphincter basically around the eyes, sphincter basically around the mouth, hypermobile areas of high points of expression on the face. So yes, uh, we do see more activity with aging around the lips. So lip lines, also the muscles that are associated with things like talking and chewing the DAO muscle. If you pinch your jowl, that's actually a muscle. And there's ways to actually modulate the way that the muscles move. And there's ways to support the skin around those hypermobile areas to reinforce and get more organized collagen and elastin. And also things like sagging skin, brown spots, diffuse redness, sensitive skin, broken capillaries are all certainly things that I see as well. So usually people have a bunch of things happening. And really the trick is living a very healthy lifestyle and looking at your body, mind, spirit, energy as all aspects of yourself that you need to learn how to cultivate to age well. Love that. And I'll share with the listeners what I've not started noticing on my face. And this is a topic of insecurity, but you know what? If you talk about your insecurities, they're no longer insecurities. So here we go. Uh, we had a personal consult, which uh, we did a couple of days ago. So a few days ago, thank you for that. And Rachel, I explained to Rachel what my problematic areas were or things I'm starting to see 
uh, not be as perfect as they were maybe, you know, three or four years ago. And those areas are around the eyes. Obviously, that's one of the first ones, as you said. And then I'm noticing just the slightest laxity in my jowls where when I, when I push on them, it's not rock hard. It's not, there's a little bit of, you know, the, the hand like goes in a little bit. And so I go, wow, that's weird. Uh, but I started noticing this recently. And so I had the consult with Rachel and we talked about, I had probably a hundred questions, but she answered them all. And it was, I'm, so I'll tell you this, Rachel, men are afraid to go into a med spa uh, because they're afraid that they're going to go in. There's going to be a beautiful girl that walks out. She's going to say, let us fix you. And then there's a doctor and a beautiful girl. And the man's like looking at both of them. And the doctor goes, you need this, 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 and this. And the bill is like $3,000. And you're like, well, now my ego's on the way. Like I can't disappoint the beautiful girl. And so like you sign up. So men are just afraid in some ways to go into a med spa because they get pressured into some of these treatments. They'll happily go to a, to, you know, a testosterone doctor or a human growth hormone doctor and get uh, their hormones fixed, but they're a little bit more uh, wary of going to a med spa. So I guess that was what's going on. And Rachel helped me from a you know, consultative approach. She's been doing this for a long time. And she walked me through all of the areas that I was worried about uh, and told me the best things to do and what not to do, in fact. So talk about what you do from a consultation with, uh, with clients. Sure. A couple of years ago, I started offering virtual consults, one hour virtual sessions. Yes, you have to pay for that information because what I noticed, and again, I was the first provider in my area to actually charge for consultations as well. Like I said before, the norm in the medical um, spa clinic model is a free 15, 30 minute consultation. It took me at least 15, 30 minutes just to hear what your, what your questions and concerns were. Right. So that model is flawed. And I just didn't think it was fair, very just speaking, totally honest here for the lovely individuals in my community to get access to me and nobody else, right? Because I was looking at things differently. I was looking at aging in a more holistic way while also using the latest technologies available. And so the, the virtual consults, honestly, a lot of men meet with me and I think it's that discreet factor. They don't have to leave the house. They can show up. It's more private. Trust me, I work with some of the biggest tech moguls out there, uh, men and women from retirees, tech moguls, everybody in between, you name it. I tend to attract a very highly discerning uh, type of individual who is really just willing to pay someone to give them the straight up information, what's good, what's not good and create a plan. And nobody else is, was doing this. I was actually the first person to do it. And a couple of years ago, people were like, why are you doing online consultations and charging for them? Like, are you kidding me? This is what people need. This is the gap in the rejuvenation, regenerative world is creating that customized one-on-one -on -one guidance. And I have so much fun doing it. I get to work with the loveliest individuals. I love working with biohackers and people that are already taking charge of the way that they're aging. Because if you are that person, you're already setting the stage for the homeostasis for what's running in the background. You're actually going to have a better response to then integrating some of the modalities like incorporating medical grade skincare, dermal rolling, lasers, maybe injectables if that's on the docket for you and body contouring and, you know, surgeries and all sorts of things. It's, it's really all the layers and the virtual consults allow me to do that. And then basically give you a report after of clinicians around you that have tech I like, or that I've trained because I do a lot of international training or that are part of my, my network of providers. So nobody else is doing it. I don't know why, but it's a lot of fun. It's almost like you timed COVID perfectly where everybody went online. You were just like, hey, I'm a year ahead of the game. Two um, years ahead of the game. I don't know. I just listened to that inner voice that was like, Rachel, do this. Nobody really gets it right now, but just do it. And honestly, uh, because the clinic I'm a part of, we closed down for a period of months. I totally lost all that revenue. So because I did listen to that inner voice and I, I did create something for myself, it was a very empowering time for me. And I was really able to help people optimize what they were doing at home because clinics were closed as well. So it was kind of a win-win for everybody. Yeah. Awesome. So let's dive right in. I had Rachel on the anti-aging summit last December, where we talked about a a lot of topics all relating to skincare and how to have better skin. Today, what I want to do, Rachel, is kind of 
walk through how people should think about a preventative routine to start with. Let you talk about layers, right? So pre preventive routine, and then we'll get into if you're already at uh, an age where you want to reverse some of that, uh, how you do that. So let's say there's tons of experts out there, obviously on YouTube and on the internet talking about all kinds of things. But are they like, actually experts? I see a true. lot of terrible advice out there. I'll tell you one sure. thing. As soon as I see a board certified provider, uh, talk about products with things like paraben salate sulfates, artificial dyes, fragrances, testing on animals, um, basically making recommendations on very outdated research, which unfortunately is the norm in the space of dermatology, drives me freaking nuts that toxic products are still being still being recommended and talked about. It's crazy. 100%. And I think I know one of the providers you're talking about, she's very active on YouTube who was recommending some of these. I saw your Instagram story on it. I don't okay. like to call people out. I'm not yeah. interested in that type of negative energy, but I yeah. think it's really important for the consumer to know that just because you hear something doesn't mean it's good for you and you have to use your wise discernment. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. With that said, let's go into what you would recommend for a preventative routine. And we can talk about morning uh, separate than evening, but what should people start doing? Let's say their 20s, uh, if women are concerned about their skin earlier, or 30s usually for men, uh, what should they be start? What should they start doing that reduces some of the damage that helps them, you know, maybe have better skin for longer without getting into a lot of the anti-aging treatments? Yeah, and exposing yourself to toxin, toxic chemicals as well, right? Mm -hmm. Some chemicals are good for us, like air and water and you know antioxidants. Those are considered chemicals from a chemistry perspective. But there's things we need to avoid. Let's start with the teens because a lot of you listening might have kids, and a lot of my clients are asking me, "Hey, can you book a you know can I do a 30 minute follow up with you and have you talk to my teen because they're buying all this junk on Facebook or Instagram or seeing what all these YouTubers are giving reviews on and they're toxic products and they're wasting a small fortune. So this is actually across the board for everybody. Just start to dial in your four basics, cleansing morning and night, moisturizing morning and night, mineral-based sunscreen every single day and exfoliating two to five times a week. And yes, the products that you use for those steps definitely are going to matter. And so I'm a big fan of just getting on the bandwagon with medical grade skincare as soon as you can. You'll probably find you'll spend less money having a tailor made uh, routine that's going to be giving you results as opposed to trying something for 20, 30, $50, having it not work and then trying something else. And I do have a really great cheat sheet available at the website. It's my sophisticated skin cheat sheet, which gives a little bit more detail, but those are really the basics, four things. And honestly, you kind of drilled me a little bit during our consulate. You're like, Rachel, how long does your routine take you? How long does it take you to get ready? I get ready in 15, 20 minutes. Might spend a little extra time if I have to curl my hair, but you know, three minutes max for your cleansing moisturizer, I, I do use an eye cream and then um, sunscreen application super fast and then do a double cleanse in the evening. Uh, that, so that's a little extra step. And then if you add things like dermal rolling, that's going to take more like 15, 20 minutes. But whatever you do to the face, start to do to the neck, the sides of the neck, especially for the gents um, or if you should have short hair, the back of the neck the top of the chest and put your leftover products actually on your hands as well. Anybody can start doing that now. Yeah. So, I mean, that seems pretty simple, but let me touch on what I learned from you, which is the back of the neck, which I give no love. I give no love to my uh, upper chest area or my neck area and I should be. And so thank you for explaining that to me. And I have a new perspective on how to approach this problem, but what you just said, the preventative skincare routine, super simple, right? Cleansing, moisturizing, sunscreen, exfoliating. Anybody can do that. I already do that. Mine has a sunscreen so much, but so that doesn't add very much. You're saying you're recommending different products. Okay, fine. I will totally trust somebody who knows what they're talking about as opposed to me like buying stuff, even from reputable brands, but I'm just buying random stuff. It doesn't, I don't know where it fits together, right? Okay, so that's the basic preventive routine, morning and night we talked about. What about for people that want to go a little bit extra? What would they do? Yeah. So the extras would be things like using an antioxidant serum, which is going to do two things, typically boost your hydration levels under your moisturizer, and also give your skin a little bit more of a dose of antioxidants to 
to be able to neutralize some of the free radicals that are going to slip through your mineral sunscreen. There's no such thing as a sun block. It's a bit of a marketing misnomer. It's a screen. Things will still filter through. And if you're using a product, I want to check your sunscreen right now. If it has ingredients on the back that says avobenzone, oxybenzone, octanoctate, you got to turf that. Those are known hormone disruptors. Also check to see if your products have things like parabens. And yes, all of those dermatology approved recommended products out there, Cetaphil, CeraVe, and Neutrogena, they got parabens in a lot of their ingredients. Drives me freaking mental. Why, when we have the clinical data out there that we know these are hormone disruptors are still available, but so is the pack of cigarettes and so is the Big Mac, right? So you just have to do your due diligence. That's why everybody's tuning into your podcast here for us, because that's what they know they're going to get with everybody you bring on here. That's true. By the way, speaking of sunscreen, I have known this for a little while. And then the sunscreen that I showed you, I found out that it didn't have the best ingredients in it. So I've used it probably three times in the last year, which is why I'm not using a sunscreen. That's the wrong thing. That's a positive response, but it's the wrong response, right? I should have been like, all right, let me get a clean sunscreen and start using that every day. We're going to do that now. Uh, So we talked about antioxidants. Is there people talk about vitamin C, like it's God's gift to mother earth. Is that the right one or is there different types of antioxidants they should think about and look at? Yeah, there's a couple heavy hitters like vitamin C, like vitamin E, like peptides, like vitamin A or retinol or retinoic acid. And those are all really great actives. Um, Antioxidants are basically free radical scavengers. So they're helping to neutralize, you know, you know, this little atom that say is missing an electron and it's going to bind to anything and then create oxidative stress. That's what Mm -hmm. creates things like accelerated aging. And the thing is, is that just because you pick up a product and it says, oh, it's got ascorbic acid, it's got retinoic acid, retinol, things like that. Just because the ingredient list says that it contains an ingredient doesn't actually mean that that ingredient is bioavailable. So I'll see this a lot with um, skincare marketing. You know, the product contains vitamin e, vitamin C, E, hyaluronic acid, peptides, retinol, and they'll spout off all of these different benefits of those individual ingredients, but they don't actually have any third-party lab testing on the final formula. Because what happens if you say have a vitamin C and it's in a product, but the vitamin C isn't kept stable through other ingredients. We mm-hmm. see this a lot, unfortunately, in like at home made skincare or a lot of super clean, all organic products is they actually lack the sophisticated chemistry and compilation of ingredients to keep that vitamin C stable. So what happens if is if a vitamin C molecule is not stable, it can actually oxidize and become an oxidant and basically go rancid. So you put it on your skin and it's actually causing more harm than good or things like hyaluronic acid, if the molecular size of the hyaluronic acid molecule is, there's many different sizes, you know, like a big bubble, a small one, an even smaller one, certain sizes of the HA molecule won't actually penetrate the cell or different peptides. If they're not bioavailable, won't actually link up to the skin cell to then create that cell signaling cascade to make things like collagen and all sorts of cool stuff. So it's pretty sophisticated, the world of skincare. So I work with about 13 medical grade brands made from the UK, Canada, US, UK has the highest regulation on making things um, be super clean in their food, alcohol, and also um, their supplements and skincare products. So I don't just work with one brand because every brand has duds and superstars. So I'll make recommendations based on what I've seen work for clients that are say coming to me, say, for example, Jill is complaining of the skin laxity and, you know, fine lines and wrinkles around her mouth, brown spots. She gets a breakout once a month. She's got some broken capillaries, diffuse redness. Okay, well, this is what I've seen help many of my clients over the last 10 years. Here's a routine that I think could help you too. So that's how I come to that uh, that guidance. Yeah, that's a great point you make in that at least these big beauty companies, right? They should be able to do more testing. I understand if this indie brands, you can't spend a hundred grand or 50 grand on, you know, like results and measuring people in a scientific study, 
but at least the big brands, they have got that kind of money. So before they pitch, before they spend a hundred million dollars marketing the latest skincare ingredient, that's going to change everything, change the world from last year, but we had one more ingredient. They should spend some data on actual before and afters. Uh, and with studies, you have to be careful because if you're funding the study, then you can kind of fudge the numbers a little bit. So that's another whole issue with this scientific study world. Uh, but what you talked about antioxidants, Rachel, uh, is super important because we take antioxidants internally. I take some of them where they help neutralize these free radicals, but you can also do that on your skin, like you said. So they're important inside and outside. And then lastly, coming back to the manufacturers, I've talked to a few beauty manufacturers over time and they tell me, oh, parabens are totally fine. They're great preservatives. There's nothing wrong with them. And I go, but there are studies saying they're endocrine disruptors. They're like, oh, it doesn't really matter because they're not looking at a 30, 40, 50 year, right? They want to sell it now. The beauty world is like, how can I make you look good immediately, right? How can I give you the glow and everything else doesn't matter. But we're looking, you and I, we're looking past hundred. We're looking to be 150 and beyond. So we have to preserve uh, our skin or bodies in a different way than somebody that just wants to look good for their uh, you know, high school reunion in a, in a week. I love what you mentioned about parabens because I'll see this all the time. I'll meet with a client in person or online and they have thyroid condition. They're on HRT, they're menopausal or they're guys and they're losing their hairline. And what products have they been using? They've been using the products that contain parabens, salate sulfates, artificial dyes, fragrances, and testing on animals. And it's really important to take the onus upon yourself to just know that certain practitioners are going to be more knowledgeable in certain areas than others. And what do I see a lack in of the world of aesthetic nursing and aesthetic medicine is that understanding of combining clinical efficacy with also the holistic health understanding. So that's where I kind of bridge the divides. And yes, I'm going to be, my next paper is going to be um, actually writing a paper on algorithm, on an algorithm that clinicians can take so that, for example, if they have a client who has an underlying autoimmune condition or issues with their detoxification pathways, there's tests that you can do beforehand so that you don't end up doing a, a treatment for them. And it kind of puts them over the edge, if you will. It's fantastic. Well, I'm glad you're doing that. Okay. So we're still building the routine. We added a little bit extra to the basic. The basic was cleansing, moisturizing, sunscreen, and exfoliation three to five times a week exfoliation. And then we add an antioxidant in the mix. Do you do that in the morning and at night? And how would you apply it? Where in the order do you apply the antioxidant? Yeah, I like to recommend using an antioxidant serum kind of on the days when you know you're going to get a little extra sun exposure or blue light exposure from our devices because that's a big one right now. And yeah, to boost your hydration levels as well. So you can certainly use an antioxidant serum at nighttime also, but it will have some of the biggest benefits of being able to gobble up the free radicals from UVA, UVB, blue light, and also from pollution. So it's kind of like a little product saver tip that I like to recommend is use your, um, your antioxidant serum during the day, and then maybe use your retinol in the evening. Now, that being said, this isn't medical advice. This is educational information only. If you think you have a medical condition or you think you have a skin lesion that's changed on you, get it looked at ASAP by a licensed physician. So retinol and dermal rolling, I see people do the same thing. They'll buy a roller online or they'll get a prescription retinol from their doctor and they'll just start using it right away. And then what happens? They get skin irritation, they get redness, they get flakiness, and then they don't use it because they also don't know how to use it. So adding those are certainly extras. You want to stabilize your skin first, then add the extras. Uh, so that's what I like to help walk people through how to integrate those actives so that that you're not having a conversation with your skin right away. You're having that, you know, whisper to it first. So then it's better able to handle the uptick in cellular turnover, which is what a retinol is going to do. So retinoid reaction phase is that red flaking dryness that you get when you first start using a retinol. People sometimes think that that's a reaction, but you got to have the right moisturizer to mitigate that dryness. You got to have a good sunscreen to mitigate the photosensitivity, which you can have the next day. And then you also have to have a really good exfoliant that isn't going to tear your skin up close if the particles are granular. It's going to buff and polish your skin as well. And because that increased cell turnover will help to, will actually elicit a little bit of flaking. Okay, fantastic. You just added two new ingredients to the extra list, which the extra had antioxidants. 
Now we've added dermal rolling and we've added uh, retinol. Do you, do people use them in combination or is it, how, how would people, let's go, let's go down the rabbit hole of retinol first. How do, how do you recommend people use retinol uh, without dermal rolling, adding to your extra routine already? Yeah. I mean, this is all stuff that I kind of give a done for you approach in a consultation. I literally write out exactly how to use the product, when to use it, how much to use it. For example, you want to avoid the eyes with the retinol. Um, but yeah, you want to slowly start to integrate it. So I walk my clients through how to do that. And I like to, you know, prepare the skin before things like dermal rolling. So I do have a specific kind of protocol that I just find works and I find how helps to mitigate sensitivities. Cause I don't want people ringing me up or emailing me saying, Rachel, my skin is red and irritated. What do I do? There are ways to actually really completely mitigate that. So that's the information that I definitely share in a consultation. Okay. Yeah. And you do a great job of that. So let's talk about derma rolling. You touched on that. Uh, there's a different ways to get a derma roller and there's different needle depths for the face. What are Rachel Varga's recommendations at a high level? You don't have to go into a lot of detail, but how would you approach dermal rolling uh, with a client? Yeah, you got to get the the one-on-one -on -one guidance for sure. So don't get them online off the third-party websites, get them through an approved distributor. And there's actually two brands of rollers I work with that have been making them since the 80s. And they're using surgical steel needles instead of blades because up close on the low quality rollers or stamper devices, they're kind of like an alloy metal. Um, when they're not made properly, they can actually get embedded into the skin. And there's a lot of people talking about dermal rolling that actually don't know what they're talking about and are giving really bad advice. And for in terms of depth, what we, want, what we care about is, well, what do the clinical studies have to say? So for example, red light therapy, more energy isn't always better. Same thing with photobiomodulation, like IPL rejuvenation, more energy isn't always better. Same with the deeper depth isn't always better because if you go too deep, you're going to get pinpoint bleeding, which you shouldn't get at home, uh, risk of infection. You also don't want to be going so deep that you could actually um, impact it your nerves on your face. So I definitely see people buying rollers that are too deep. And also if they're not made very well, you don't actually know if that specific length was actually tested to be that length. So there can be some misinformation around that too. But yeah, I mean, there are specific depths that I do recommend and I see people going way too deep at home for the most part. Okay, fair. So let me ask you this. Obviously, if you're doing rolling, at home, you're doing this often, you wanna keep the depth pretty low because you're using the derma rolling as a technique to improve the penetration of the topicals into your skin so it can be more efficacious, it gets, gets past the dead layer of skin that you have on top of your skin, right? Uh, so that's amazing. Now there's also uh, dermatologists and other practitioners that have you come in clinic for a more advanced, deeper derma rolling. How's that different? And how often do people do that? Yeah. So the in-clinic stuff is going to be, you know, you have a topical applied and sometimes people are combining it with PRP. I do have my own opinions on whether I think that that's efficacious or enough, enough, or if you should just do the rolling at home, or if you should invest in other laser modalities. So there's a lot of these treatments that will pop up that people see on Instagram and Facebook as being really popular. But what really depends is what's right for your specific skin needs. So if you show up to a clinic and you say, I want this treatment and the provider hasn't said, okay, well, you know, maybe this might actually be more helpful for you in your case. Um, that's kind of stuff that I'll guide people through, but dermal rolling is great because it does allow for a more transdermal application of your products. So you can't just use, say, for example, any type of moisturizer that's meant for topical application on top of the skin. So dermal rolling, we're creating these little channels of injury, and then your products are able to penetrate about a hundred to a thousand times deeper. So you have to use super clean products that are actually determined to be safe and effective, clinically effective alongside dermal rolling. Cause there are a lot of kind of like bogus copper peptides out there that there are no studies and you want to get deep enough into the skin to actually penetrate the keratinocytes, which is what's creating things like an age spot. And then allowing things like your copper peptide to be able to integrate and help with things like uh, hyperpigmentation 
in H spots. Okay, great. Thank you for the explanation. Rachel has recommended uh, derma rolling at home for me, and she's also recommended a copper peptide that I will be using after my derma rolling treatment. Um, and so that's one. Now let's move on to a different area, Rachel. I want to talk about the area around the eyes. You mentioned this earlier in the podcast. These are some of the areas that go first, if I may. You notice this more often than people than other areas. And so what can people do around or about their under eye bags um, and how they show up, the appearance, the, you know, the pigmentation that happens? What are your recommendations? Well, you can read my paper on it <laughs> okay. because I talk about taking a multifaceted approach, skincare, laser rejuvenation to promote collagen, to help to thicken up the skin around the eyes. So I get asked this all the time. Oh, you know, someone's coming to meet with me and they say, my friend Susie has lower eye bags and she wanted to know what type of creams you recommended. And the, the answer is always, well, I have to see them. I have to see what's going on with their lower eye bags. Is it in fact loss of collagen and elastin and the skin is very thin and creepy. So we're seeing more of the underlying blood flow or the muscle around the eyes, which is if you look at the inside of your forearm, you can actually see your blood vessels, right? So it's got that blue tinge and the similar thing is happening in your lower eyelid area. The, the skin in your lower eyelid, I did this really great uh, cadaver lab with Dr. Kodafana. He's a Mayo Clinic cadaverist. And we were taking part the different layers of the face and the skin around the eyes here is as thin as an eggshell. So that darkness you're seeing is your underlying muscle and blood flow. So is a cosmetic cream going to do anything to magically thicken up that skin overnight? Absolutely not. So that's one thing I want you guys to stop buying right away is like a deep puffing lower eye cream or a serum. Basically an eye cream is going to feed the skin and it's going to hydrate the skin, but you got to keep the skin around the eyes sun protected. The clinical data says that about 10% of all skin cancers is actually from an ophthalmology paper that I read a number of years ago, 10% of all skin cancers on the body occur in the eye area because it gets so much exposure. So 10% right here, the eyes, brows, nose, compared to the rest of the body, that's pretty high amount. And so sun protection every single day is really key. There are some lasers to help with the laxity and the creepiness. Sometimes there's some modulation that can be done with injectables to lift the brows. And sometimes there's even surgeries that could be indicated for removing excess skin to the upper or lower eyelid. Sometimes the bags in the eyelid area can be caused by the underlying muscle. So when you're talking about your jowl as well, same principle, when the muscles of in certain areas of the face flex, it stretches the skin out that's on top of it as well. So that can be one of the reasons why we get changes around our eyes and jawline is that stretching of the skin. But sometimes we have little pockets of fat in the lower eyelid area. And also we can have soft tissue, fat, bone, and collagen loss in the cheek area, which is what's supporting the lower eyelid. So as you can tell, there's at least four or five things that's happening to contribute to someone's lower eye bags. Mm -hmm. So that's why when I meet with clients, I can kind of give them a little bit of direction as to what to focus on and maybe not to what, what not to bother with. Yeah, there's definitely more than meets the eye. No pun intended there. It's a good but, one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I, I know that some practitioners will do tons of filler on the under eye just to get rid of that, that hollowness, if you will. And you've got a perspective. I have a few friends that have gotten done the filler, uh, to be honest. I, I, I haven't yet. And I won't, given what you're about to say. But uh, please uh, give us your perspective on under eye fillers that are so popular these days. Safety, safety, safety. So my area of specialty for the last 10 years has been in oculoplastics, highly specialized type of plastic surgery office where we focus on the eyes and obviously full face and all that stuff. So when people have an issue with tear trough fillers, what happens? They can wake up a month later, three months later, nine months later, three years later, nine years later, and they get swelling and edema or migration of the filler. This can all happen, right? And there, it creates an unnatural distortion or a ton of swelling because of the blocking of the lymphatic drainage around the eyes, which is very important and occurs in the soft tissue in the lower eyelid area. So I got really sick and tired of fixing people's botched lower eyelid tear trough fillers. I was probably fixing two or three botched treatments a week in my local community. So what did I do? I wrote a paper saying, stop doing this, do this instead, because 
you know, myself and the surgeon that I work with, we are the most um, qualified individuals to do teardrop filler. And do we have to do it? No, we can actually do other less invasive, more longer lasting options that isn't going to potentially create unnatural looking distortions or even potentially have some of that filler migrate into a behind the eye. So the tricky thing, and I really feel for consumers right now, people will see the before and after photo of a tear trough that's just been filled. And yes, the um, darkness is less because there's more distance between the muscle and the blood flow and that, that outer layer of the skin because there's been extra space added to fill in the groove. And so that's why you're seeing less discoloration. However, what can happen is over time that filler can move a little bit and you can get a Tyndall effect. So the filler could actually, uh, when the light hits, the filler could create more of a blue tinge and making mm -hmm. things look not so good. And yeah, it can look good initially, but what they don't show you in their before and after photos on their social media is, you know, potentially what happens months or years down the line. So we always have to think long-term with these yes. options, especially with fillers. And, you know, people think that, oh, fillers, it's something that's already in your body, hyaluronic acid. It's honestly probably the riskiest thing that you could do in a med spa because of the risk of vascular occlusion, blindness, and things like that. So just saying. Wow. Wow. Interesting. I was actually considering doing one of those soon, but not after all the warnings you've given me lately. Um, so, okay. So you're saying don't do fillers. Instead, there's a multi-dimensional approach. You can go above the eyes, lift the eyebrows a little bit. You can go, uh, improve the tissue, get the density and the, and the, I guess the thickness of that tissue under the eye back, uh, try to uh, possibly brighten some of that area. I don't know if you said that, but, uh, maybe, uh, but also lift up these areas around the chin so that it supports the cheek, your the on cheek, the cheek. Yeah. not the yeah. cheek <laughs> pointing to the cheek, uh, on the cheek. So it supports your eye better. So it's not just all falling down. Um, yeah. To compensate for you losing the cartilage, the bone, the fat, that's all moving down because of gravity. Okay. Gravity wins. Good to know. Gravity wins for now. <laughs> all right. Let's talk about the next area. You kind of briefly touched on this, Rachel, uh, the jowls and a lot of people, you see that in, in people, the jowls are just, they have more of a, I guess when they're younger, they have an oval face uh, or like a triangle face pointing up. And then as, as life goes on, it becomes more of a rectangle when the jowls fill in. So what can people do as a preventative measure? And also if they've already got jowls, what do you do at that point? Yeah, I have a great episode, actually. Uh, Dave Asprey on Bulletproof Radio, episode 668. You should check out our very fun banter, actually. Do you remember all your episode numbers? Just or that just... one, because that's a big okay. one that I like to refer back to. Okay. So we lose a couple of things in our faces, fat, bone, collagen, and elastin. So yes, we start mm -hmm. off with that upside down triangle shape right? Where we have more volume in the cheeks. And then what happens is we lose the scaffolding in the cheeks and fat compartments descend and break apart and get smaller and all sorts of fun things. And then what happens is we get more of that volume hanging out to the jawline because we've lost that scaffolding. So it goes from like an upside down triangle to like a regular triangle. Yeah, we get wider up. here. Yeah, you mm -hmm. got it. I don't know the tactical term for turning a triangle upside down, but there you have it. So my paper that I just wrote, that's actually going to be um, in print in just a couple of weeks. So probably by the time this has been aired, you can, again, search my name, Rachel Varga on PubMed. You can find that paper. It might be a little technical. It's more for providers because I do a lot of teaching at rejuvenationtraining.com. But yes, the jawline, there's a couple of things happening. We lose our upper jaw and we lose our lower jaw bone. It recesses back and then the tissue descends. And then the muscles in your jowl here, if you pinch your jowl, it's a little muscle, gets big and bulky. So that's what can attribute for some of the volume. And then also in our chin, our chin gets larger as we age too. And it can create kind of like that orange peel effect on the skin, which can uh, basically make you think you have large pores on your chin, but you don't. It's actually just the muscle underneath it changing things. We also, under the jawline here, under the chin, in the submental area, where we think of like the double chin, there's a couple of glands and some muscles and things like that as well, which can account for some of the fullness, which is why I wrote this paper, because sometimes people are thinking that the submental fullness of the double chin is just fat, but in fact, it's not. 
it changes to um, the hypertrophy of muscles and glands and also loss of bone and soft tissue above the jawline that affects her. So that's why I wrote that paper. It's a big safety piece actually to do some of these less invasive, less expensive options first, as opposed to just going straight into, you know, taking care of the fat there, which usually isn't. So it's going to be a combination of keeping up with your skincare, maybe getting the odd injectable treatment in. Maybe it's so significant that you actually just need a full on lower facelift, right? So it just depends, but uh, not sleeping on your stomach is a great place to start. So I do recommend a specific anti-aging pillow. If you just reach out to me, I'll tell you which one that is. And that actually reduces your facial compression because facial compression is what accelerates the loss of fat in your cheek and your temple, um, also bone reabsorption, any vertical line on your face. So say, for example, you face palm yourself and pretend you're side sleeping. Every vertical line on my face, this is super attractive. Uh, so between the brows, crinkling of the eyelids, a little bit of the vertical lines on the upper lip are contributed to side and stomach sleeping. So using a good pillow to help prevent that compression is a really great place to start. But no, not all anti-aging pillows are created equally. I'll say that, I'll say that much. Yeah, agreed. Uh, so there's a lot there to unpack, but... Uh... You're saying for some of these, it's a multi-modal approach that you might need to correct some of these areas of your face that are problematic. With the eyes, be careful of anything, any fillers, because they could cause problems. I've also seen friends that have gotten filler in their eyes and they've got a bloody eye for a week because I think they hit a vein or an artery uh, under there as they're putting, pushing the calendula. Just saying, I've never given anybody a black eye in my 20,000 <laughs> rejuvenation procedures. Do you, how do you do that? Do you host, hold a UV light to tell you where the vessels are while you inject? It's understanding the anatomy and doing it in a way that I've coached my clients to avoid certain things before mm -hmm. treatments as well that could precipitate bruising. But I mean, it really does come down to technique. Every time we're using a needle, there's always a risk of maybe bruising, but I always get a bit, you know, dumbfounded when I hear of people getting, for example, Botox around their eyes. And that's just a brand name of something called a neuromodulator. Mm -hmm. And the way that it's been applied, the injectors actually skewered some of the facial veins which is what's creating that uh, black eye effect, which, which shouldn't happen if you're in the hands of somebody who's really good. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you a question that uh, I've been wondering about for the last few years regarding Botox and a couple of things. Number one is it's a neurotoxin which paralyzes your muscles temporarily so that you don't deepen, uh, your creases look less, uh, less bad, I guess, and you don't deepen the creasing as you're you know, doing whatever with your face, smiling, laughing, uh, things that you do regularly. So it prevents the, the aging, but also makes you look younger. But the problem is, so one, one question to you is that, is it safe, body limb toxin? It just says it's a toxin, freezes your muscles. So to me, I'm like, I don't know if that's safe or not. And the second part of that question uh, is, why, why are these manufacturers selling it to you for only three months? Is it purely purely a safety thing because they don't want to inject it in your skin for longer or do they want to keep you coming back every three months for life like what's going on okay this is sweet because i got my finger on the pulse of the research so right. if you check out my first paper and yes i included the same graph in my second paper i give a readout of the top three neuromodulators on the market i'm not really going to say the brand names so you can read my paper because they are there but they're all made a little bit differently. So if you think about what's causing the action, think of it as like a jelly bean, okay? So there are there is one product on the market that's just the jelly bean, it's just the active components, the neuromodulators, the core neurotoxin. And then there's other brands out there that have the jelly bean sitting inside of a tennis ball. So that extra tennis ball is representative of extra preservatives and complexing proteins that don't need to be there. Their role is considered unknown but it's the chemical composition which has allowed things to become patented. And I'm getting a little technical, but you have to get technical to understand these concepts. So 
the way that these neuromodulators work, and this is in the published data, is they interfere with the SNP protein. So there's like these two little proteins that allow the vesicle that's containing neurotransmitters from your nerve to then bind with the nerve membrane to release acetylcholine to make your muscle fire. So what happens is the effect of the neuromodulator snips that protein so that vesicle can't fuse, okay? But over time, the body's really smart and really wonderfully and beautifully made in case you haven't noticed, the body will actually reform those broken um, connective receptors. Okay. So those connections will be remade. Now there is a other product that's coming on the market. It's new. I don't like new. I like stuff that's been around for at least 10 years and, uh, I wanted to put that in my paper, but my peer review colleagues took it out because I think they think it's a bit too broad. But honestly, this is how I practice. I don't use new injectables that haven't been studied on the masses for 10 years. I'd love to be able to put that in a paper, but unfortunately what that can do is it can kind of like pigeonhole people from trying new things, but I don't like my patients to be guinea pigs. Um, so that's just important for you to know about me, <laughs> but there yeah. is, yeah, there is a product out there that could have longer longevity of about, you know, six months to two years. Don't quote me on the clinical efficacy of how long that protein can be snipped, but, uh, yeah, the body just reforms that connection. So the issue is if you have a longer lasting neuromodulator and you get an eyelid drop or a brow drop with it, or an asymmetric smile issue, because the way that the products are applied will vary dramatically from injector to injector. So if you are thinking, oh, you know, Botox, 13 bucks a unit, 10 bucks a unit, I'm going to go here. It's a little bit cheaper. You're not paying for the product. You're really paying for how it's being applied. So I hope that makes sense. But that's the concern I have of some of these longer lasting options is that if you have an issue, you're kind of stuck with it because there's no way to reverse that little snipped um, snip protein and, and binder. Uh, your body just has to go through the process of regaining that connection. So that's the downside with it. And also safety, it hasn't been used on the masses for again, that 10 year rule. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's not just the money, right? Cause when you follow the money trail, all kinds of things jump out at you and you're like, huh, I know. come back every yeah. three months. How convenient buy more Botox units. Yeah. How convenient. So I do want to say something though, yeah. that yeah. my clients that just do injectables don't look nearly as good as those that are, you know, they've taken, they've taken the red pill, right? They're living a really healthy life. They're doing their at-home care. They're doing their laser treatments and they're only doing injectables or surgery if they absolutely need to. That is something that I like to recommend is do the least invasive options first and don't do things that you don't feel good about doing. Or if you have underlying health issues and your body's already overburdened with detoxification, you got stuff running in the background, you got to put your health your health first and foremost. And when you meet with a provider, they might not ask you those questions. So now you know. Yeah, no, I like that about you because you are bucking the popular trend. The popular trend is put a little hyaluronic acid filler under your eye, you're good to go. You look beautiful, the before and afters are dramatic, uh, but you're saying, no, don't do that. So I, I respect that. It's hard to go against uh, the grain that is being fed. But you know what? Devices. When I present on these topics, I actually get inundated with positive messages from my colleagues being like, hey, Rachel, I was totally thinking about that. Thank you so much for for talking about this because I've been feeling that way too. Mm -hmm. So I, it's not that I get flack for it. I actually get really good um, positive feedback from it when I share these types of different ways of looking at things. Okay. Fantastic. And we're coming up on time, but I have a few more questions if, uh, if that's okay. Cause I know you push back uh, a consultation that you have going on or about to start. Uh, you talked about hair loss, hair growth, and how we're putting a lot of products into our face and our hair that are, at the end, harming us, be those parabens, be those endocrine disruptors, be those even carcinogens, uh, phthalates, benzoates, parabens, all of these. What is your perspective on how we should be using hair care and how does that impact, impact hair loss or hair growth? Well, first of all, does your hairstylist actually care about ingredients? So I go to actually a hair salon that prides themselves on being a natural hair salon. That's actually what they're called, the natural hair salon. And they use products that are actually not going to be toxic to the hairdresser, right? Because, you know, the hairdressers have their hands and stuff all the time. So I can definitely make some recommendations. I actually have a really great hair oil 
on my online store at rachelvarga.ca. Just so you know, not everything I work with is available on uh, e-commerce because not all the medical grade skincare lines allow that to happen. So when you meet with me, you get access to like 10 other brands than what I have up there. But yeah, using clean hair products is really key. And yeah, you can even do dermal rolling. I work with a tiny, tiny stamper. So smaller than the one that I saw you use, it's much smaller, but it can allow you to reinforce your hairline, go into your part, you know, the crown where you're having some hair loss. And then you could put things like um, the other ingredients and products that I recommended for facial rejuvenation, or you can use things like minoxidil or Rogaine. Um, there's definitely clinical studies there. PRP for the hairline. I definitely have colleagues seeing some pretty sweet results from that, but that's definitely another thing that's going to be technician dependent on how good they're at it, delivering that treatment. Okay. So stay clean. I didn't know you could do any chemicals in Vancouver Island. I thought it was all like organic farms everywhere and no chemicals allowed from the mainland, but maybe so. Uh, so that's one. Number two, I want to ask you, this is a tough question, Rachel, uh, again, it's like following the money, right? I'm just trying to discover what's going on. So with Botox, part of me suspects they want to do it every three months. You raise a good point that if it goes wrong, then you're stuck for six months, right? Part of me suspects they want to do it because they want to sell more units and have people coming back to the practitioner. The practitioner loves it. They're like, keep coming back because I got to inject you. I'm the best. Uh, two, so that's one. Uh, the second piece is these lasers, right? They have like $140,000 lasers, why is it that expensive? I don't think yeah. anything costs more than 10K to create. I can't believe it. There's DIY hackers creating a laser for $1,000, right? So maybe maybe I'm ignorant, but let's say it costs 10,000, they're, they're charging 140. Well, the practitioner that's buying it now has to make a lot of money or make up that money, first of all, with a lot of treatment. So they have to recommend all kinds of lasers. Thirdly, with pharmaceutical skin grade care, why is it available through practitioners only? Why is this not available on websites for these companies like Environ or Dermaconcepts or others? What's your perspective yeah. on that? Yeah, great question. So number one, I am going to interview the creator of one of the neuromodulators that I mm -hmm. personally um, like because it's the cleanest one. So I'll get his take on that because I'm sure he'll have an answer. It might be similar to me. It's just that they don't have a molecule that can um, adjust that binding protein for a longer period of time. That's what this next product does. So that's to answer that question. Uh, number two for lasers. Yes. I work with two $140,000 lasers and yes, I can take them apart, do some maintenance as needed. I'm pretty handy that way. And um, they're pretty jam packed with technology. So I've certainly seen and heard of people making their own lasers. The issue with that comes down to also components and also um, having the backing of a really good company that if you have questions or say something um, isn't working as well, the flash lamp isn't working great, maybe the fiber optics cable on the NDA isn't, isn't performing well. There's lots of components that go into making a really, really good laser. So I'm a little bit leery of some of these, um, you know, made by hand things. And they typically aren't going to be able to do all of the things. They might have like an NDA, they might have an Erbium, they might have an IPL, but some of the really sophisticated technologies actually combine all of those in one. And, you know, the safety's in the numbers, right? I don't want to throw on a machine and do a treatment for somebody and then whoops, that fluence was wrong because it wasn't made great or there wasn't safeguards in, in place to shut the machine off if it can tell that there's a modulation in the Joule output. So as you can see, there's a lot of technical things that run in the background. So I like using technology that I know is going to turn off if it's calibrating itself before each firing and it doesn't meet a certain threshold. It's not, you know, between in a window to, you know, I don't want to burn somebody. And I also uh, want it to be efficacious. So that's mm -hmm. what really sophisticated lasers are doing is each fire. They're actually, um, it's getting detected the energy. And the third question, a lot of companies, medical grade skincare companies will require that you have a consultation with a provider so that people are using their products properly uh, because active ingredients can carry things like side effects, like the retinoid reaction phase, right? And if you're not using things properly and you don't have the right products on hand to mitigate issues, you're going to ring up the company and say, hey, I had an issue. I want my money back when really that could have all been circumvented if they just have the right guidance in the first place. 
So a lot of companies will do that to protect their brand and also to protect their brand from being sold on third-party websites and being counterfeited. So this is really important. So a lot of the brands I work with, if you see it on a third-party auction website, it's a counterfeit because they don't allow those third-party e-commerce sales. So it's protection for a couple of different layers. I gotcha. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Sorry. That was a tough question. And I think you answered pretty well. Not a tough uh, question. I got answers. <laughs> yeah, you do. Okay. So I think we've talked about your consultation and why I think, I personally think it's important because I've been doing things haphazard. I think anybody that wants to preserve their skin and have the best skin possible should get a professional, a consult with the professional. And I think you are a great one. So folks, if you're listening to this podcast, reach out to Rachel Varga at rachelvarga.ca. That's CA for Canada. Uh, she is truly an expert and answers all my tough questions and gives me really good advice. So thank you, Rachel, for doing that. And thank you for uh, being a force for good in the world. Now, uh, where else can people find you? Oh, by the way, before we do that, uh, you've got a discount code for listeners of this podcast. So if you mention or you put in anti-aging 15 when you're checking out, then you'll get a 15% off. Is it 15% off or $15 off? I forget. 15% off. 15% off. Thank you for doing yeah. that, by the way. Yeah, uh, my pleasure. So lastly, where can people find you online? Where else? I have a ton of free content out. We just did an interview on the podcast, Rachel Varga podcast, also on YouTube at Rachel Varga and on Facebook and Instagram at Rachel Varga official. So definitely subscribe to the podcast, subscribe to the YouTube channel. And I do have a freebie. So if you go to rachelvarga.ca when you're booking your session, there's this little pop-up download my sophisticated skin cheat sheet because it just gives you a bit of an understanding of how to cleanse, moisturize, sun protect, and exfoliate kind of wherever you are with what you're using at home and then get that dialed in, you know, and until you meet with me and then I'll kind of expand further in that. Fantastic, Rachel. Thank you. This has been such a great interview. I've learned a lot in the last few days just from you. So thanks for coming on and I'm going to have you back very soon. My pleasure. 